Good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this webinar in the series that the India International Center New Delhi hosts, uh, which is called History and Heritage, the Afterlife of Monuments. Uh, I'm extremely thankful and grateful to the, Indian Inter to the India International Center for hosting the series and to the program office um, for running it efficiently. To all the members in the program office, uh, uh, it has been a great pleasure working with you. Uh, the series started um, in a year and a half ago, and uh, the series really draws attention not just to the aesthetic appeal of monuments, but also to the lived experience of people who have maintained and preserved these monuments, and also who have a deeper engagement um, with the monuments which they maintain. So before I introduce the chairperson of the session this evening, let me talk to you a little bit about the next two lectures, um, which will both be held in the premises of the India International Center. They will be in-person lectures. They will not be webinars. On Thursday, 7th June at 6.30 p.m., Dr. Sanjay Garg of the National Archives um, and a a renowned numismatist. Uh, he will speak on coins of the realm, a numismatic overview of 18th century India. And almost a month after that, on uh, Friday, the 7th of July, uh, again, uh, in the premises of IIC, uh, there will be a presentation on the Harappan site of Rakhigari in Haryana by members of the Archaeological Survey of India. So I do hope that many of you who are in Delhi uh, will make it to the IIC for these two lectures. Let, let me shift now and introduce the chairperson for the webinar this evening, Dr. Sri Kumar Menon, whom you might recall, he had earlier presented his own work um, at the site of Badami um, in North Karnataka in this same series. So we are very, uh, we are very grateful that he has agreed to chair this session. Uh, and um, I really look forward to the interaction that we will have after the lecture. He's an associate professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bengaluru. By training, Dr. Menon is an architect, but has a keen interest in astronomy and archeology span of the Indian subcontinent. He travels extensively, takes great pictures, uh, and is really engaged with studying many of the monuments um, of uh, Karnataka, but also the wider pan-Indian context. And um, what I like about his work is that it's not just the monuments that he is interested in, but he is very um, efficiently able to weave, to weave in stories from folklore uh, relating to their builders, to the people who live around them, to the villagers, in his accounts of the way in which he relates to the megaliths, the temples, and the other monuments um, in uh, the subcontinent. So with these words, thank you, Dr. Menon. And I hand over the uh, platform to you to, uh, to uh, uh, moderate the evening's proceedings, Dr. Menon. Thank you, Professor Ray. Uh, and welcome everybody to this uh, IIC webinar series on history and heritage, the afterlife of monuments. Today we have with us Dr. Lisa and Owen, of the University of North Texas in USA. And uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Owen is an associate professor and chair of the Department of Art History at the University of North Texas. Her research focuses on India's ancient and medieval rocket monuments and how carved imagery and space contribute to creating ritual landscapes. In addition to her book, Carving Devotion in the Jain Caves at Alora, which is published by uh, Brill in 2012, Dr. Owen has published uh, essays and edited volumes on archeology span and religion with Routledge, Mark, Oxford University Press, etc. She has received numerous grants to support her fieldwork in India, including a fellowship from the American Institute of Indian Studies, a Fulbright Nehru Research Scholar Award, and a Harvard Foundation Fellowship. But today she will speak to us about the afterlife of afterlives of Jain monuments in early medieval uh, Tamil Nadu. And in this presentation, she will be reframing and expanding upon her work uh, on the numerous Jina images which are carved into the lock, rocky landscape around Madurai and at the sites of Kalyugumalai and Uttamalpalayam, these reliefs which are incised into the surfaces of rock in the 9th and 10th century CE are generally found in association with much older uh, ancient rock shelters 
which served as residences for Jain ascetics. Now, what accounts for the early medieval reuse and transformation of these ancient abodes? Why carve images and what purposes did they serve? Uh, now, uh, she says that uh, her initial interpretations that highlighted their roles in devotional practices, she has uh, come to realize that these reliefs served multifaceted purposes, including articulations of lineage, power, and protection across southern uh, Tamil Nadu's rocky landscape. I'm very excited to listen to this talk because this is a landscape which I really love and I've traveled in. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful landscape, as you'll find from Dr. Owen's pictures. Uh, and before I hand over the platform to her, I have an announcement for the uh, participants. Any questions that you might have for the speaker, please uh, put them in the Q&A box that you will find at the bottom of the screen. Now, with that, I'll hand over to uh, uh, Dr. Owen to talk to, talk to us about the afterlives of Jain monuments in early medieval Tamil Nadu. Dr. Owen. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. There we are. So thank you very much, Dr. Ray, and thank you, Dr. Menon, for your introductions. And I'd like to thank um, the IIC officials and IIC members for this opportunity for me to present um, my work for you. So um, what I thought I'd do in this talk was to kind of rethink and, and sort of reposition myself. Um, I've published some articles and books and chapters um, on these really interesting Jinnah reliefs that you see one example here in this um, first slide um, that are found around Madurai and the hillsides around Madurai and also um, at Kaluga Malai in Uttamapalliam. So I visited these sites and as this talk will explore I had this primary focus of really thinking about these role, the role of these images in devotional contexts. But um, in retrospect, rethinking about my work, reframing some of my arguments, I'm really understanding now the power of these reliefs in sort of different ways. So I'm excited to present this material to you and then hopefully to get um, some nice feedback in the Q&A. So before, um, I begin, I thought it'd be important to just highlight some of the sort of general characteristics of these ancient Jain abodes that you can find um, across the state of Tamil Nadu. Um, and I wanted to sort of show you just a couple examples here to sort of set the scene for then some great transformations and changes that happened in the ninth and 10th centuries. So in general, many of these ancient Jain abodes or residences um, served to support Jain ascetic communities. And as you can see from these two photographs, in general, um, we're really talking about natural shelters, right, that are created out of these rock formations, these granite formations that again are found throughout Tamil Nadu. And in those natural shelters, you find artists have gone in and for example, carved these rock cut beds, such as you see in the photograph on the right. So these beds that are carved into the floor of the rock, sometimes they're polished, sometimes they're only separated by sort of a shallow ridge line, um, but pretty much convey this notion, right, of, of austerity. And certainly these monastic sites, if we compare them to contemporary Buddhist caves, for example, of the same period, second century BCE, in Maharashtra, for example, right, we have a great... Um, uh, an, an emphatic difference in terms of how these ascetic communities are visually presenting in their residences and how they're living in these residences. So we don't find spacious halls and pillars and other architectural elements, but literally um, sustaining and maintaining the natural landscape um, and really only punctuating that landscape with the addition of these carved rock cut beds, um, steps, carved as well that sometimes in this landscape, sometimes it's the steps that you see here that kind of signal to you that there is um, a, an ascetic residence, right? That, that leads to them. And sometimes these are modified in the modern period um, to help visitors um, such as myself coming and visiting these sites. So it's a real, uh, only a slight um, alteration of this rocky landscape. And then we also have, of course, inscriptions from the same period, so from 2nd century BCE up to the 3rd century CE, that also give us some information about these early ascetic communities. 
as well as the interactions these ascetic communities had with the, with the laity who were there in, in the nearby villages. Um, and of course, that important relationship, right? Because the monastic communities um, had to be in contact, right? With the laity in order to receive donations, donations of food, donations um, towards other things as well. And in return, the laity could get monastic instruction from these um, communities. So it's, these are, this is sort of the setting for what then happens in the ninth and 10th centuries, which then is an addition of carved imagery that appears again across a number of sites. I've, I've only visited a select few, um, but this seems to have been a pattern at this time. And so I'm showing you here a couple examples of some of the sites that um, I was able to visit. And you see a plethora of images. Sometimes it's only a solitary image. So all of the sites are quite different, but you see this emphatic presence of the Jinnah image, right? Being carved on these surfaces of rock. And sometimes these um, carvings are found on separate boulders that are located near those ancient rock cut beds. Sometimes the artists are carving the images of um, Jinnahs and Jain goddesses. Um, over the brow, um, directly over the beds. So there is a clear association between what's happening in the ninth and 10th centuries and a re, seemingly a reoccupation of these uh, ancient abodes, but then also transforming this into sort of a new, um, a new site and a new, certainly new visual experience um, as well. So this is what attracted me to these sites, right? These um, expansions um, of rock, and across their surfaces, you see all of these images. And again, each site is a little bit different. I in, initially went thinking I would find um, more direct patterns of things, but each site is actually quite unique. Um, so I'm going to just show you a few things. And again, where my thinking is leading towards these. But this was again in the ninth and 10th centuries, right? With this, with this addition now of these new reliefs. So for this talk, um, there's two key questions that I also tried to answer in, in my um, earlier scholarship on these Jinnah reliefs, which is really what might account for these, you know, happening in the ninth and 10th century. So is there something socio-historically, socio-culturally that's happening? Um, you know, what is inviting this um, real interest in relief sculpture being added to these ancient sites? And then a second and related question um, is the question of why carve in relief, um, especially when uh, in, in thinking about if these are reliefs serving um, important devotional functions for devotional activities, then the question is why not a temple or why not a cave being created? And as we saw with uh, Dr. Menon's lecture last summer um, on Badami, and, and he was focusing on the Breeze Pavilion, um, or the, the double mandapa, um, he demonstrated, right, that that structure was actually created from the very rock that supported it. And this could have easily happened at all of these Jain sites. So if there was interest in creating a cave, a cave could have been scooped out of these rock formations. A stone temple could have also been created with rock quarried out of this expansive landscape. Um, and we just don't have the evidence or no extant evidence um, that this is really the case. So for me as an art historian, I was really interested in, in why the relief, why does that seem to be, um, uh, and again, a bas relief, so carved on the surface um, of these rocks. Why was that then the sort of the chosen visual representation to demarcate sort of these sites with this renewed vigor? Um, so those are two questions that we're going to sort of address in this talk here. Apologies for this text slide. This is the only slide that has lots of text. But um, before I came, was able to come out and do field work, of course, I kind of combed through the scholarship to see how authorities in this field, and again, I'm coming from my previous work in Maharashtra, so Tamil Nadu in um, art, more of the, you know, the southern, um, tip of the subcontinent, you know, was new to me, a new, a new territory for me to explore. So of course, I was, you know, really much interested in seeing what the authorities say about these reliefs. How did they explain this, um, 
new sort of uh, reoccupation of these ancient sites and, and how did they discuss the purposes of these reliefs? So there are two scholars that were really important to me. Um, that's uh, Eka Baranathan and Champaka Lakshmi. And I've just um, pulled here just some brief citations from a lot of their writings, but to demonstrate the fact that they both independently sort of arrived at um, the important transformation of these sites from residences to now places of devotion. And one thing that I won't go into any detail right now, but we're certainly open to talk about it in the Q&A, um, is that both of them really position this, what they see as a new um, interest in Jinna icons or reliefs, um, based on it being a reaction to uh, Vaishnava and Shaiva Bhakti movements that were happening um, in Tamil Nadu in the seventh, eighth, ninth centuries. And so their understanding of the reliefs really um, came from the fact that they saw James as reacting to these bhakti devotional movements and activities. And in that reaction, they were then seemingly kind of pushed back, um, as Champaka Lakshmi states, right, elbowed out of the major centers, um, basically being confined to these ancient hill abodes. Um, and then transforming those abodes into worship spaces by the use of these reliefs, these images. Um, and one thing I would, I, I push back in terms of my own work, this sort of has the, the narrative that somehow Jains were not interested in, in uh, worship of Jinnah icons any time earlier than the ninth century. And of course, the art historical evidence does not um, adhere to that, right? We have... Uh, much earlier images and interests in Jain devotional practices with images in the South much earlier than this. Um, but nonetheless, we can talk a little bit more about that in terms of the, the Q&A. My main takeaway by looking at the scholarship here was to then see that both of them arrived again at this important purpose of devotion. Um, and so when I came to do my field work, that was my focus too. Um, to come and take a look at how these reliefs might have been uh, used and, and venerated in worship activities. My view out of all the work that I had done at Alora. So I'm showing you here a, uh, an image of one of the many Jane shrines in the caves at Alora, um, where I spent most of my early scholarship was at this one site in this numerous caves there. Um, which was really wonderful field work to do. And while at the site, you know, one of my main um, interests again was recontextualizing Jain practice in the ninth and 10th centuries at Alora. And so I spent lots of time looking at these shrine reliefs carved inside the shrine, inside the caves. So, you know, there was an actual interior space to walk into, a shrine to enter, and then one is presented with, you know, basically life-size and, and sometimes over-life-sized images of the Jinnah, such as you see here. So wonderfully preserved images. I was able to go in and do very close looking. Um, I was able to take a look at any wear and tear on shrine images. For example, were images replastered in some cases to account for um, constant rubbing um, or abhisheka. So looking for evidence, basically, of physical um, devotional practices. So lustration, looking for um, traces of soot, right, as evidence of oil lamps being burned in these spaces. Um, I also took a look at whether or not images had traces of successive um, painting and overpainting. So I'll show you a couple more examples here, again, from Alora, where you know, you're able to tell from centuries of use because many of these shrine images were repainted. Um, so created in the ninth and 10th centuries. And then in the 14th century, they all received um, um, uh, some more paint, right? And some um, other fixes in these shrines. Um, and so I was able to closely look and sort of determine what kinds of things happened within these spaces. So again, detecting evidence of soot, looking for metal hooks that would have held um, um, garlands of flowers, and even looking at how the image is presented. Oftentimes in Alora's shrines, 
um, there were platforms created um, on either side of the Jinnah image, and these would be suitable places to set um, either offerings, physical offerings, or to um, hold trays that could be used in devotional activities. So really understanding the space and the evidence of the imagery um, themselves to recontextualize the kinds of activities that might have happened in those spaces. And in that work, I also discovered some images, such as these fourfold Jenna images, the one on the right you can see, which is unfinished, but it gives you an idea of what the unfortunately now missing damaged uh, image looked like on the left. Um, being able to understand that in some cases, some of the caves had certain images that were designated for practices like Abhisheka. And this was because they had um, in the base of the images, so the fourfold Jinnah image would have been carved on the image, for example, on the left. And in the base of that image, here you can see I'm highlighting with this blue square, um, a viala, so a horned lion with an open mouth. And this served as a funnel, as a way that would then drain out um, the fluids from Abhisheka and from lustration, right? That the fluids could be collected and then dispersed um, appropriately. And so I could tell certain images where Abhisheka seemed to be a dominant um, practice uh, of devotion for the image, whereas in the shrines, it seemed to be less the case. Or maybe if there was Abhisheka, it was, you know, in terms of the small amount, because the shrines, for the most part, did not have drainage channels or other things that would help, again, funnel those fluids um, away, because you certainly aren't going to have an image that would just pool that material everywhere. It needs to be collected and disposed of properly. So um, these were the kinds of physical evidence and things that I was used to looking for. Um, so coming out of that work on Alora and then moving into this new context with Tamil Nadu, I was obviously then met with different kinds of challenges. So nonetheless, um, as I said, since I'm kind of reframing and expanding upon my previous work, um, you know, I still was interested, right, in, in focusing on how these reliefs um, might have been used in devotional practices. And the fact that I really had to work hard at this should have maybe been a signal that there are other things going on here that I needed to pay attention to. Um, but in my initial work, that's kind of what, you know, again, my lens was really looking at this. So the first site that I was able to visit was Kalugamalai, which is a really complex and challenging site to even begin this kind of investigation with. Um, there are over 150 relief images of jinnas and Jain goddesses. Um, and I, like I said, it's a very complex site, but this is one that I began this search with. Um, and so I titled this section kind of iconic presence to, you know, again, note that there is some evidence that does suggest certain images were used for devotional purposes, right? But this again would not be a plate that you could apply to everything in every site. But I went through the site thinking about this. What is the practical aspects? Um, and you know, and it was a very different experience for me because uh, as I mentioned, right, there isn't an interior space to walk into. There isn't a necessarily a shrine to go into. And so how is space conceived? How is performance of worship practices conceived of? with reliefs that are carved across surfaces of rock. This was you know, an interesting and very attractive um, means for me to, to look at this work. This is why I was attracted to many of these sites too, um, for this very innovative um, use of the rock. So here's a detail of just one of the boulders at Kalugamalai. There are many boulders that are carved with reliefs, but this um, photograph gives you um, some important information about the jinnas and about um, the process of creation. Um, and in fact, what you see carved beneath the images too, right, are these um, donative inscriptions. So we also have the uh, epigraphical evidence to take into consideration as well. And as you can see with this photograph, I mean, this essentially becomes sort of a billboard of, of jinnah reliefs. Um, and you have underneath almost each one, right, that, that donative inscription that tends to identify um, the lay donor, in some cases, sometimes a monastic donor at Kalugamalai, um, 
it also usually describes the place where the individual comes from and if it's a lay patron, what the occupation of that lay patron is. So they're pretty succinct in terms of the information, but taken as a whole, um, you can put together a lot of information about the communities living here at the site, participating in the site, and even those who have traveled some distance. Again, mentioning if we can make correlations between ancient um, town names and today, right? We can even determine a catchment area of people who are coming into um, Kaluga Malai, for example, and commissioning such images. So we have these records. And then um, my work has really depended on uh, the work of Leslie Orr, who has really looked at Kaluga, Kaluga Malai and has um, recognized the fact that we have a lot of, um, of female lay patrons here at the site. So this is kind of very exciting too, to see a, a great number of lay women who are coming. Um, and again, having their names inscribed um, underneath these jinnas. And importantly, looking at the visual presentation, you know, we might be tempted to kind of think about, are there any panels here that represent all 24? And there really isn't. Um, there are individual donations or sometimes donations of two or three Jenna images, but there doesn't seem to be an interest in representing all 24 as a cohesive group. Um, and we also have, um, with the exception of Parshvanatha, who I'll talk a little bit more about, um, you can see Parshvanatha on the lower left in this photograph, um, recognizable through the canopy of serpent hoods um, that protect and shield the Jenna. Um, Otherwise, the, the jinnas remain undifferentiated. So again, there's not a great interest in articulating which of the 24 there is, um, and neither in the inscriptions is this mentioned. And I will come back to um, this in, in, in just a few moments. But again, just wanted to share a close-up of these reliefs um, and to see, again, their complexities in terms of the ways that they are carved, the kinds of information both through visual and textual materials that um, are presented to us. So as I mentioned, right, I was interested, like how does worship happen to a series of reliefs carved on a boulder like this? So in my initial work on Kaluga Malai, then I was interested in looking at, um, on the lower right of the photograph, this little natural cleft that was um, created here. Um, through that rock formation, and then artists using that cleft and presenting a series of images. So I did focus on this cleft here to think about accessibility in terms of devotion. And here are just some close-ups of that. So as you can see, these are images that are immediately accessible, right? So they are accessible to touch, um, to make offerings, to, to basically be in that same space. So again, trying to really see this in a way, does it operate in similar ways as shrine imagery within a cave does, for example. And then one thing I was also really interested in um, is that when we focus on the central triad presented in this space, in this cleft, and I'll just highlight it here for you. I noted one thing that was quite interesting too, is like the juxtaposition of images. So um, a larger seated jenna, flanked by two smaller seated jinnas, and then flanked by the jinnas, well, the jinna Parshvanatha, and then the Jain figure, um, Gomateshvara or Bahubali. Um, this is a pattern that we see quite a bit in ninth century metal images, um, basically across the subcontinent, not just in the South, but um, all over India. And this pattern, um, also then made me think of that this is what artists are echoing, right? So this, this um, juxtaposition of these, these jinnas and again, framed by Bahubali and Parshvanata, something that's also found in images that we know, for example, are used um, for devotional activities, these smaller metal images that would be set up <clears throat> on altars um, within temples um, and even maybe next, next to rock cut. Uh, images in shrines. So invited me to also kind of um, hypothesize about the ways that these images, right, could have been worshipped. And again, artists then recalling this um, arrangement of forms with other forms that we know were under devotional use. 
one image at Kaluga Malai in particular stood out. Um, it literally because it was carved within on its own boulder. Um, it's a large image, about four feet in height and about a foot maybe in depth. So carved within its own <clears throat> rectangular niche um, and presented right with an iconography that I was used to seeing, for example, in, in Alora's caves with an enthroned um, seated jinnah on a lion throne um, with the triple parasol and foliage and celestial figures coming in with offerings. Um, fly whisk attendants on either side of the throne, and even figures down uh, by the base of the image that may represent right, human worshipers. So it was a scene and an iconography, right, that I was also familiar with. Um, and this particular image, again, stood out to me as one that would certainly be easily accessible, right, for worship um, activities. And in fact, when I was there at the site, um, you can see the remnants of some offerings of incense that um, a lay couple I met who are actually visiting Kovalpati um, from UP came and they were actually venerating the Jinnah when I was there. Um, and so even today, right, this it sort of draws the attention that this is an image, right, that is readily available, right, for worship activities. So this was, again, part of my um, looking at the site and, and finding out ways that these images could work, right, within this context. So within that same lens, I also travel to Uthamapalium. And this is another site that has a, a number of images, not as many as Kaluga Malai, in this case, maybe about 19 reliefs, all jinnas <clears throat> carved on this selected boulder. Um, and <clears throat> with the photograph, you can see um, that's a modern day, right? Pavilion that's been erected. But nonetheless, it may echo, right, in the medieval period, in the ninth and 10th centuries when these, these are created, that um, a shelter or a canopy certainly could have been inserted into those square holes that you see um, up above on the top uh, of the jinnas and also maybe some kind of platforms secured on the bottom. So I don't know when those square holes were carved, so that's some of the difficulty, it's kind of hard to date um, <clears throat> those additions um, of those holes, but it does seem to intimate, right, that there was an interest in securing other kinds of features, right, to shelter the images, um, to demarcate a certain space for worshipers. And in some cases, even in the rock in front of the images, you could find holes in the ground that also could have been used, um, uh, again, for these structures that have long now been gone. So maybe structures where they made out of um, timber or other materials that haven't survived, but again, creating then sort of um, an actual space, right? So that we can approach and engage, right? In worship with, the, with these images. So again, this is the kind of physical evidence I was looking for, but it's also very different from the kinds of evidence that I had seen, for example, at Alora. Both Kaluga Malai and Uthamapalium uh, have, as I mentioned, the inscriptions. You saw some examples um, from Kaluga Malai a little bit clearer, but Uthamapalium's reliefs also underneath them have these donative inscriptions. So there's a, a nice body of material that we can look at, again, for more information. And importantly, as I mentioned, they're, they're donative, so they're pretty succinct. And so we don't find a lot of information about use and purpose and, you know, why these are created. Um, instead, we have who paid for it and, you know, the name and then maybe the village and the profession of the patron. Um, and so information on devotional practices um, is pretty rare. Although the, both of these sites in longer inscriptions in adjacent boulders at the sites, you can kind of tease together some information. Um, and this is, again, work that Leslie Orr has done on to sort of understand what was happening, for example, at Kaluga Malai. So we do have mentions of Abhisheka, lustration. We do have mention of um, donations of ghee or sheep um, to establish perpetual lamps to be burned in front of images. Um, so you can tease out small things about that, but it's kind of unclear as was this done in front of these rock boulders with all of these reliefs? <clears throat> Are these mentions of devotional practice 
Were they in reference to maybe a temple that's no longer surviving? So again, making that connection is still a little bit um, difficult um, in, in terms of that. What we also find, which is I find extremely interesting, um, is the fact that none of these reliefs um, of the jinnas are ever identified as jinnas in the reliefs. So I'm interested in looking at the language that's used. And so they're not identified as jinnas. They're not identified as arhats. They're not identified as tirtankaras. Um, but the terms alvar, deva, and tiramini are what appears in the inscriptions in reference to those reliefs. Um, and as um, you know, tiramini um, kind of translating into uh, sacred form or holy form. Um, is something that is not, and actually all the terms, all of our deva, these are not terms that are specifically Jain. So that's what I found to be really interesting, right? You can find them in other Shaiva and Vaishnava literary contexts and in inscriptions too. So that kind of is interesting, right? Because it really has us questioning modern day interests in trying to identify, well, which Jinnah is that? Um, and maybe that's not the right question or maybe a question that just didn't seem to be important to the communities and the artists creating these. So that's something that I kind of want to also come back to. So that, and they're also not mentioned by name. So it, they're not mentioned like as if it's Mahavir or Parshvanatha, even when we know it's Parshvanatha with the iconography of the serpent canopy. Um, they're not named in the inscription. So we don't, there, there doesn't seem to be a, a great interest in identifying these specific jinnas. Um, and again, not even re referencing them as jinnas, but as with these terms. Um, and then lastly, there's some really great interest in um, using these terms, but also using the terms in association with the larger landscape around them. So in the cases of Kalugamalai and Uttamapalayam, there are references to um, a lord of the rocky hill, um, at Uttamapalayam, there's a, an inscription that refers to a lord of the hill of auspicious qualities. So auspicious qualities is defining the hill. And then this relief is just the lord of that hill. So, um, and then another common sort of phrase is also identifying these reliefs as a mountain lord. So the, the constant referencing to the landscape around the reliefs, or where the reliefs are cited, <laughs> you want to think about that, um, also now is, is of more interest to me. And it's it's expanding my views then of, of how we need to really think about these reliefs. Uh, and again, maybe they're more multivalent purposes. So outside of strictly a devotional context that I was working so hard to, to have happen at these sites. So I'm kind of, um, as an additional lens, I'm not abandoning devotional functions for some of the images, but they inherently are doing more than that. And so I'm trying to expand my lens and my interpretation to include other ways uh, these reliefs are being viewed and interacted with. And so I'm thinking about them in terms of how they're demarcating the landscape. And so in one point we can think about it as how do they demarcate a, a specifically Jain landscape, even if they're not referred to as jinnas or arhats or tirtankaras in the reliefs, their iconography right tells us very clearly, especially when you have a whole boulder, you know, that is incised with these images, um, you know, that these are jinnas, right, that they're recognizable, right? So is this demarcating, right, this Jain landscape? And so part of my thinking likes to think about what rock and why rock. Um, and so at sites like Arithapati that you see here, um, you know, you have both an inherent beauty of the landscape that's um, I think being commented on. And then maybe even we can ruminate about the nature of rock itself, um, particularly in its use with communities, right? That give a primacy to Ahimsa. Um, and so rock seems to align with that in very interesting ways because you're um, privileging rock and that's um, keeping you away from using building materials that could cause harm to things um, like insects and things that would inhabit um, wood and timber and thatch and mud 
And so creating these spaces out of rock, you know, heightens the sense, right, of non-injury to things. Um, and then we also have the, the resonance of rock in the sense of durability and being permanent. And I think those are attractive characteristics too. And ones that we might also align with ascetic practices. You know, the fact that rock can sustain all kinds of climatic conditions, right? Um, the, the rays, you know, from the sun, um, torrential rains, um, biting winds, and they're still there, you know, and they're still shaped by it, right? Because we get these wonderful rock formations and different ways that they've been exposed to the to the weather and climate. Um, and is that sort of in similar ways than how the ascetic community views itself, right? Is also permanent and sustaining this. So these are just sort of more interesting ways to try to understand, you know, why these uh, why rock and 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 why carve here? And, and how else do we see these um, images? And at Aritapati, this particular image, um, the inscription also mentions um, aspects of protection. So it actually has a, a statement that this relief needs uh, to be protected by the local communities here. Um, and it names specific groups. Um, that are again sort of in charge of that. So there's a sense too of some kind of protection happening within this landscape, both by communities and I would say also with these images. Um, and returning to our first slide um, of the side of Muttapati, um, we have two Jinnah reliefs carved on this uh, giant boulder. Again, too, too, you know, too high up on the boulder to be really accessible for devotional practices. But then at the site, we do have this wonderful loose sculpture that's now secured there at the site underneath that boulder um, that could have been accessible for it. So again, um, having it, uh, these images work in different ways. But the inscriptions associated with these two Jinnah reliefs at Muttapati also talk about issues of protection um, and the landscape and also um, bring, uh, a specific, another important site that's not too far away, um, the site of Kila Kuyulkudi. Um, and so it's mentioned that those inhabitants, these images were created for those inhabitants too. So it's presenting suddenly a linkage to another site. And I found that to be extremely important. Um, especially when I went to visit the site of Kila Kuyulkudi, I saw this board, this signage, um, you know, obviously here from the, um, the Tamil Nadu Tourist Board, um, and particularly wanting to identify, right, these important Jain monuments that you can go and visit. And I, this visually kind of helped me out, literally, when I was at the site, just thinking about the interconnectedness of some of these sites that I was visiting, particularly those clustered around Madurai. Um, and it also made me think about why these particular hills and landscapes were um, identified and used as early as they were for the ancient abodes. And so it made me also think about their intravisibility. So from one site, you could definitely look across and especially those around Madurai, you could see the hills um, at a distance. You can still see them today, which tells me that um, in the ninth and 10th centuries, and even actually, even earlier in the second century BCE, when many of these sites were, you know, essentially begun, right, where the ascetic residences were created, um, these hills were um, selected, maybe as navigational centers, maybe for their visibility, their prominence, which, um, you know, even though we can see them today, given the building up of cities and air pollution and other things we have to deal with today, they certainly would have punctuated the landscape in a really dynamic way in ancient and medieval um, Tamil Nadu. So um, thinking about where these uh, sites are, mapping them out, um, tying them to traditional ideas about these, there's sort of eight important hills around Madurai that are identified as, as important places of pilgrimage to, for Jains to travel. 
And through looking at both the geography, the topography, and looking at literary sources, scholars have identified at least four of those hills being ones that um, I was able to visit and I'm presenting to you today. So, you know, making these important connections and thinking about the power of the landscape is something that I'm interested in. So it answers to the question as to why um, in the second century BCE, these sites are chosen for to create these ascetic beds and these residences. And it also adheres to why in the ninth and 10th centuries, they, they, come, uh, they become reoccupied by communities. Again, to sort of tap back into that presence and power. So rather than being elbowed out of major centers, as scholars have talked about Jains in this period, um, you know, and kind of running for the hills, literally, I mean, they're doing that on purpose, right, as an active um, engagement because of the intravisibility of these landforms. And importantly, the fact, as we sort of move here too, the fact that they are um, not just important to Jane's. And so that's another facet of my work that I, I really need to explore more, which is understanding how they're contributing to a larger ritual landscape, because these hills are also um, important for um, for other religious practices and other articulations of uh, of religious presence. So at Kila Kuyokuri, there is this um, uh, this cave known as the Sheitapotavu cave. Uh, again, we have a beautiful Jinnah image on uh, carved on a boulder to sort of demarcate right the Jain presence here, but also thinking of this presence as right a lord of the mountain. Lord of the Hill. Um, and as we go inside this cave, then we also have a series of images that include three jinnas. Uh, and then also uh, they are framed or flanked by uh, two Jain goddesses. And in Leslie Orr's work on this particular cave and on these reliefs, right, she notes for the Jain goddess that you see carved on the left, we're reading left to right. She noted, right, a, a striking resemblance to, to Durga, a very famous Durga panel um, at Mamalapuram, right? And so in, in her own work, right, she had other articles and, and publications where she was interested in um, really questioning, right, issues of identity, you know, is who, which goddess is it? Is she Jain? Is she, is she Hindu? And again, maybe this identity uh, question and question of categorization is sort of the right, wrong angle to take a look at for this. Um, clearly, these goddesses are important, right, as framing these three jinnas. And again, this is also having us open, uh, be more open to ideas of audiences coming to these sites that may or may not necessarily be Jain. And again, that is some somewhat of a departure from my work, because when I was thinking about their devotional functions, you know, I really was focusing on both lay and ascetic communities. How are these images functioning for Jains, either as, as part of the laity or part of the monastic community? And, and now I'm really interested in, or in opening this up, right, to more diverse audiences who are exploring, experiencing, and coming into these spaces. And so also at Kila Kuyulkuti is are these reliefs at the side of Pechipalam. And so here you can see there is eight reliefs here. Um, and four of them are images of Parshvanata. Again, how we know that recognizable through the iconography, um, whether it's just the serpent um, hoods that you know are spread out and covering and sheltering, um, protecting Parshvanata, or in some cases, one case you can see on the on the um, lower right where you see Dharanendra, right, the yaksha, and with the canopies, right, protecting and standing behind Parshvanata. So initially, my work at Pechipalam kind of focused on a much later 12th century inscription found further down from the reliefs that men mentioned the Parshvanata temple at actually um, in Shravana Belgola. And so those are interesting connections and in thinking about, is this a site really catering to Parshvanata? 
But as you can see in front of the reliefs, right, there is actually a rock cut pond. So um, a rock cut structure that can collect rainwater when it comes. And obviously in the times that I was visiting, right, you can see just a little bit of the water. Um, but looking at other photographs of the site, you can see how this rock cut pond can be plentiful. Um, and so the juxtaposition of these reliefs over this water source was interesting to me because it made me think of connections more with issues of Nagas and their association with water and protecting water. And so maybe, you know, this isn't to discount Parshvanata's importance, but maybe the reason there's four images of Parshvanata here have more to do with the Naga imagery in association with the serpent, Dharanendra. Um, and again, this idea of protecting, sheltering over this water source. And it's very different than the ascetic abodes, right, which tend to have channels cut near the beds to divert rainwater away from the residences. And here with these reliefs, we see almost cradling, sheltering and supporting, right, this important water source. So again, the, you know, artists and the patrons are making decisions as to which images are being carved here. So I don't think it's just, you know, sporadic, but this focus on Parshvanata here, again, may have more to do with the underlying meanings and roles of Naga imagery and water sources. And then lastly, in terms of thinking about choices, this is also something that's really important to me, um, is that you know, these are our conscious choices that artists are creating. In some cases, they're selecting rocks that have a very planar surface, very smooth. Um, and so then images can be cut indirectly and they sort of line up almost as if it's you know, the sidewall of a cave. And in other cases, the artists are choosing boulders um, and um, maintaining the undulations of the surfaces of those boulders. So not choosing ones that are, that are planar, but really embracing um, the curvature and natural forms of the boulder. And this also, I like this because it's, it's very different than, for example, when you look at reliefs carved on cave walls. Um, this is, again, really enhancing the natural landscape. And it also makes me think of artists, especially with images and many that tend to be unfinished, appear to be just emerging from that boulder. So I also kind of like to think about it in terms of um, conceptions like uh, of being svayambu, of being self-generated or self-created out of these forms. So are there interesting ways for us to think about, in certain cases, how things are carved, the way they are carved, um, and how they, uh, again, enhance the natural landscape? What kinds of meanings can that also um, convey to those of us who are then experiencing these reliefs? And then the last sort of component and ways of thinking about these uh, images um, have to do with uh, some known patrons for some of the images. Uh, in the case of these two sites, Alagarmalai and Kurungalakudi, um, we have information of these images being caused by the monastic teacher, Achanandi, who's named here in the inscription, almost identical inscriptions. And so these two sites too also really pushed me to think more beyond devotional practices. In, in these two cases, we're talking about sites that this is the only relief they have. And particularly in the case of Alagarmalai, this one was really difficult to reach and, and to get to. And so um, <clears throat> surely there <laughs> are easier ways um, if you're creating an image for devotion the, the, to do it than what happens at Alagarmalai. So I'll just show you a couple of photographs of um, traveling to this site. <clears throat> and they're working with um, my colleague, Shantalingam, um, and hiring um, someone local to come and take us because it was really difficult to find. Um, and when we finally arrived at the ancient abode, and it's a very large site, there's over 50 rock cut beds, by the time we reach there, 
<clears throat> and a number of inscriptions. So it's a site also really known for its epigraphical evidence from the early period. Um, but in the 9th and 10th century, we have a single addition to the site, which is this single <laughs> solitary relief of Agena. And you can see Shantalingam is there taking a photograph of this relief. And then I've highlighted in, on the photograph on the right where it is. So <clears throat> again, at the brow of this um, natural boulder, the rock cut beds are located directly underneath. So, so there's a direct correspondence between the decision to carve this image above the beds. But again, one that was very difficult um, to reach. Kurungalakudi, it was a little bit easier and it's a little smaller site, but again, a single relief. Again, um, uh, an image donated by the monastic teacher, Ajanandi. And at Kurungalakudi, there are two little areas for rock cut beds, one adjacent to the images, uh, the one, sorry, the singular image there, and then on the photograph on the left, you can see the rock cut steps where that leads to an upper story area where there were also a few um, early, very early rock cut beds. So these two sites, you know, given their inaccessibility, uh, and again, it's just a singular um, relief and clearly one that could not, you know, be applicable for any kind of devotion in a sense of, um, physical touch or even lustration, it's kind of impossible. Though one could set up a lamp, one could do bhava puja, for example. Um, however, given the succinctness of the inscription and the brevity of this relief, this has um, encouraged some scholars to suggest that these are portrait images of Ajanandi, our medieval patron that's mentioned in the inscription. And while there's no way to necessarily determine that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it is clear that um, there is an interesting slippage thinking about the name Ajanandi, um, uh, his role as, the, as an important monastic teacher in Tamil Nadu in the ninth century. His name shows up in at least um, eight other sites apart from these two, um, for uh, again, for commissioning an image. Um, and the fact that we don't have a lot of the um, paraphernalia, the rest of the iconography for Jinnah images, um, the halo, the triple parasol, the foliage, celestial attendants, any, anything else. I mean, really, we're only talking about the body of the figure and this double lotus support. But I think it's an interesting idea to think that both the text and image are working in interesting ways together. Um, visually presenting us this figure, um, of course, in meditation, as all jinnas are, but also it's commenting on maybe the kinds of performance and practices that would be happening directly underneath, right, in these ascetic residences, where these ascetic communities are. And assumedly, right, where <clears throat> this new monastic lineage, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> where this new monastic lineage is now um, reoccupying this space. So reclaiming a more ancient past for this new monastic formation associated with Ajanandi, I think is really exciting to think about. Um, and again, thinking how text and image here work uh, in interesting ways, right? To promote, right? These practices kind of, um, visualized here with this strong message, right, of just this meditated figure. And interestingly, at Kur uh, Kurungalakudi, <clears throat> in addition to the rock cut beds, there is um, one section of those beds that was kind of covered with dirt. And so I brushed off all the dirt to see, you know, is this just another bed or what is this? And interestingly, it's a, you know, as you can see, it's a pedestal or seat um, that is carved with three lions, and you see a detail of one of those. So establishing it, right, as an important seat or pedestal, maybe for a important monastic teacher at the site, maybe for an image. I mean, that we don't know. But what it is signaling, right, is this interesting connection between, right, this head of the monastic community and thinking of the Jinnah relief then as, as kind of focusing and functioning 
as a way to demarcate the importance right, of this teacher and of this um, uh, reclaiming of the past and to tie it with this new monastic formation. So all of this evidence together, I think is really exciting to think about the roles of these reliefs in terms of um, thinking about ideas of lineage and maybe even commemoration too, and the past. And then just putting these two together, right? And, th and this is the right, this is on the, the beds that are closest to that Jinnah relief. So again, bringing those two things together. So I'll end this talk here with just sort of a, you know, a conclusion here, bringing these things together. So um, again, thinking about um, the multivalency of these images, thinking about new ways to think about um, reclaiming heritage, reclaiming the past, and yet transforming them into new spaces. And then also thinking about demarcating Jane presence but also it's a presence that's further complicated when we pan out and view the larger landscape to think about sort of greater interactions in creating um, spaces that would involve certainly more diverse audiences. And I think I'll end that there and, and kind of open it up for a QA. and a Thank oh, should I go ahead and stop? Should I stop share? Is that oh, I think best? You can stop sharing. Yes. Okay, good. We got it. Thank you, Dr. Owen, for a riveting talk about the, you know, the Jena images of the uh, in, uh, landscapes around Madurai. I found it very interesting. And uh, we have one question. So before we go into that question, I would request the other participants, in case you have any questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So I will uh, tell you the first question that is uh, by Mihir Keshari. So he asked that, uh, does the fact that the inscription are referring them, not specifically as Jina, Arhat, or Tirthankara, but as Alvar, Deva, and Tirmeni and all that, like what we're saying, does it showcase mm -hmm. that the larger laity was going un undergoing some sort of a religious cultural transformation as initiated by the Bhakti current, where the old religious sites were in use, but the ideas about them were going through transformation? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you so much for that. Um, what I would be interested in doing, and, and so I'm going to answer your question with a question, um, would be an interesting um, project would be to kind of trace this language, these terms found in other inscriptions. So my knowledge of the inscriptions is based particularly on these sites I visited and with the, the scholarship that also addresses those sites. What I would love to see is, is this an earlier pattern? Do we see this? Because we do have earlier Jinnah images in the South. That's the thing. It's not, this is not suddenly a new, like Jainism suddenly becoming interested in, in icons and worship practices. It's, this has been happening for centuries of time. The question would be, is are there earlier images that are inscribed and what are those terms being used there? And unfortunately, that's something I have not investigated and, and I don't know, but that's, I you know, do we contribute it necessarily to the bhakti movements? I am a little hesitant to do that because again, that always makes it seem like Jains are constantly only reacting to things or having to do things because of great pressures coming in from, um, from these bhakti activities. Whereas I think they can be their own agents and do this. And, and maybe it's, it, it has to do more with a conceptual sharing of ideas. It has to do with the landscape. These are terms found within this landscape. So is it an issue of landscape? Is it an issue of image? This would entail looking into earlier inscribed Jinnah images to see what terms are used. And I think that would be, thank you for that question. That's something I would love to do. I have not done that yet, but um, I don't know if any, anyone on the panel or anyone in the audience has that knowledge, but that that would be my first step to try to answer your question. Thank you. Dr. Thanks. And the next question is by Varsha Das. So she asked you whether uh, she has not heard about goddesses in Jainism. Who are they and mm. what are their names? Yeah. So what are they? What are their names? That's a, another fantastic question. So we do have at the sites that I visited, I'll contextualize it with that. We do have um, images of Padmavati and Ambika. Those are the two most prominent um, uh, Jain goddesses, in, particularly in the 9th and 10th century, that are found in association with these sites and these reliefs. 
Um, we know their names as Ambika and Padmavati, mostly through um, understanding the iconography. So again, like the Jinnas, um, they are not necessarily inscribed with those names. Um, and it's only in later times and later iconographical texts that we have authors who are really interested in clarifying what was obviously happening in the iconography and the art much earlier on. So your question is like, who are they? What are their names? It's something, a question that later medieval Jane authors, um, particularly in writing about images, were interested in trying to identify. So who is Padmavati? She's recognizable through a singular serpent canopy. Here, she's usually four-armed. Here are the things she holds. So we find in iconographical texts a great interest in trying to pinpoint who they are. But I think in the, the earlier medieval period, they're very fluid. And to actually even identify them necessarily as Jane is sometimes a little hard. And for Ambika, she looks like any other Ambika image. And the only reason we know she's a quote unquote Jane Ambika is in the headdress, sometimes she'll have a small uh, Jinnah, seated uh, Jinnah in her, you know, carved in her headdress. Or if it's a metal metal image, you know, it'll be cast there, a small Jinnah, which would affiliate her, right, as a Jane goddess. But otherwise, she's very recognizable, really, as a larger pan-Indian goddess. Thank you. We do not have any other question yet, so I have a question myself. I have a few of them, actually. <laughs> okay, so I will just ask you what, I was struck by this uh, resemblance of Peche Pallam, which I visited. With this, uh, uh, I mean, visually, I've, there's no other link to it. Uh, uh, this place called Arali Tirtha and the cliffs near Badami, east of Badami. Oh, Arali yes, yes. I, yes, yeah. I visited. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Both of them yeah. are around natural pools, uh, spring-fed or whatever. And you have all this ima imagery of uh, various gods and in Hindu gods in that case, in uh, that place. But what struck me during your talk is that all the Surya images, I think there are at least three Surya images, they're all depicted with a Naga hood over that. And there's a water source nearby. So it's something oh. similar to your Parshanatha identification. Thank you for that comment because, um, and thank you for that question too, because my interest, um, I mean, so this work, you know, led out of my Alora Jane Cave field work and interests, um, but I'm also very interested in just sort of the reliefs in general. So I'm also looking at reliefs at Badami and Dr. Men, and I'm very happy. Uh, Dr. Ray introduced me to your work at Badami actually. So is a, it's wonderful to meet you in, in well, virtually now, but um, your work on Badami is so important, and I have visited Arla Tirta, and um, so thank you. I, I will go back and look at those um, photographs I've, I, I took there, because I am interested in this, yeah, this function of reliefs in really powerful ways, and like there, again, it's the undulation of the rocks, there's the pool, very similar things, and that's, I'm kind of, the larger book project that I'm working on right now is from looking at different case studies of these reliefs at different at different sites and trying to again capture the dynamics of what's going on there. So I really appreciate your observation on that because that's something I want to look at myself. Thank so. you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Okay, there's one more question that's coming. Uh, it's from Hari Krishnan N. How do we look at the notion of a cultural landscape in the region, vis-a-vis -vis the Tinai system of the Tamil Sangam poetry? which is hegemonic by the virtue of usage, even in the Vaishnava, Shaiva, and Kaumara Bhakti, but hasn't been considered together in the Jaina Buddhism context generally. Yeah, so that, okay, that's a, yeah, really great and complicated question. Um, so in one thing I have to be careful of, admittedly, um, as I want to look at this larger cultural context and this understanding of dynamism and fluidity, particularly between traditions, I, <clears throat> I, I need to be careful that I'm not saying that everything was harmonious and, it, you know, it, it's all shared and things are fine. <clears throat> there are points of contention and discord um, and competition and rivalry, right? And we find that in the texts um, in particular, but that's one body of source material um, and one that I'm uh, I'm less equipped to really deal with. So I'm coming at it from the visual and art historical angle. At the same point, um, I want to recognize these tensions too, because I think it's important. Um, so on the one hand, we have 
Jane's, you know, reoccupying these ancient abodes um, and establishing presence at the same time that even new things, what would be important to note is new things in the ninth and 10th century are also happening on these hills, particularly for Shaiva traditions, caves that are being modified um, and built and um, carved there as well. So you have something I didn't mention in this talk, right? At all of these hills, you can find other uh, caves dedicated to Shiva, for example, that are also receiving new modifications. <clears throat> so it's certainly a dynamic landscape um, and one that also can represent this competition. And so I don't want to downplay that. I'm just it's harder for me to discuss that with the visual evidence, though I will say um, I can do that in some sense with some caves, for example, some Jain caves in Tamil Nadu um, from a little earlier period, so more seventh, eighth, that were clearly then um, recarved to become Shaiva caves. So that's definitely an interest in reutilizing and occupying this space now as Shaiva. So um, thank you for the question. That's something I do want to negotiate in my work um, a little more clearly, because I do have a tendency to kind of create it as, again, it's um, with the diversity of communities. With that, you do have periods of tension. But what I don't want to do is characterize it like... Um, as as a period that was completely contentious, which I think sometimes the sometimes the literature, you know, in its discussion of Jane's marginalizes and treats it so horribly that, um, you know, whether or not that was actually occurring on the ground or this was a rhetorical strategy, that's you know something that has to be dealt with. And again, with the literature aspect, I'm a little less equipped to handle that, and I kind of come at it more from the art historical one. But I very much appreciate your comments on that. Thank you. There's one more question from Katie Ravindran. Is there any evidence of Jain sites in early CE in Tamil Nadu? So yeah, so the, a lot of those uh, those beds uh, from the very beginning, um, at my talk, I just showed you a couple examples. Um, some of the earliest are those Jain um, residences. So most of them are just natural shelters that only have rock cut beds carved in crevices. And, you know, sometimes there's uh, rock cut steps that are carved there too. Um, but importantly, right, you don't have, uh, even though images um, certainly by the first century CE are really, you know, proliferating across the subcontinent in India, you don't have the addition of imagery to those ancient abodes until this period. And this is what's led, I think, scholars to assume that there's somehow then just, it's sort of like created only because of bhakti in reaction to bhakti movements, um, Shaiva and Vaishnava bhakti movements, that suddenly Jains go, oh, hey, we have Jinn images. Why don't we have them and worship them? Um, this has been happening for a long time, but what's interesting at those sites, this doesn't really take off until this period. So that is also something I'm still trying to work at. But those early, early caves date, some date as early as third century BCE. Um, and we have lots of inscriptions from that period too that help us contextualize the earliest um, Jain sort of communities and, and those monuments. They're, they're less known, especially by our art historians because there's not a lot to work with. <laughs> you know, there's, there's beds, <laughs> there's inscriptions and that's, that's kind of it there. <laughs> so thanks. And the drip just I guess. <laughs> I have an extension to that question uh, because, uh, I mean, considering that you have uh, the, the standard uh, hypothesis says that you know, Jainism spread from uh, Karnataka to, uh, to Tamil mm, Nadu. Yeah. So how come we do not have any early inscriptions in uh, Shaman Belgola, for example, Jain inscription? The earliest one is in 6th century CE, if I'm right. So how come there are so yeah, that's right body of inscriptions in Tamil Nadu, but not in Karnataka where it came from? Yeah, that's a great question. And th there's a positive. And, and, and even when I was doing this um, this work, even trying to find, for example, images, I mean, they're there, but, you know, you've got some um, metal images from, from Andhra, for example, um, and, you know, some rock cut things again, but a lot of those then had been transformed into Shaiva spaces. So, 
they don't survive intact anymore? Um, it's a great question. It seems like why why does the recording seem to happen so late? Um, and I'm not sure. And I think in some ways that's why Uchanundi becomes sort of a champion because his name suddenly is everywhere. He's he is thought to have hailed from uh, Shravana Belgola. He comes to Tamil Nadu and establishes the Nandi Gana in Tamil Nadu. And we just don't have a lot of earlier records than that. And I I can't answer. I don't know. But I mean, I I all I do is recognize the paucity <laughs> with you, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure why. Dr. Ray, do you have any questions for? Yes, um, yes, thank you. Um, so I have um, a couple of questions, but let me start. Oh, there is, I think you have in, a, in the Q&A one, one more, but let me just ask okay. one question and then, you know, you can go to the Q&A. So would you like, would you expand uh, a bit on, uh, um, you know, the, you talked about the nuns, the lay devotees, and mm, you said uh -huh. that the female patrons um, were particularly important at uh, Kalugamalai, as uh, Leslie Orr has uh, discussed. Now, uh -huh. uh, to, to really, uh, if you can expand on this, is this the only side that was number one? Or do we have uh, female, uh, female lay devotees at other sites as well? And following from there, um, you know, when Leslie discusses her work on temples, she does talk about women being involved in different kind of temple activities you know yeah uh, and being part of those temple activities so but since these the sites that you are that we are seeing um, these are really um, very different kind of sites i mean there's not that much um, to do at that site i would say <laughs> so are these yeah. part of the pilgrimage you know i mean would these be part of the pilgrimage circuit and but that would then mean that they should be at other sites as well rather than just at one site so yeah okay great question so um i know at utamapalayam there are I, I can think of at least one i'd have to go back and take a look at um there, but i mean there are other mentions of um of female lay devotees at utamapalayam so that could be looked at in comparison with Kalugam Light. Kalugam Light kind of is its own case study. I mean, because it's it's just, it's so different from the others. It's first of all, it's so many images, so many inscriptions. And what do we do with that? It, does that mean it's kind of a an oddity or does it represent something more standard that these other sites just because of their smaller number of donative inscrip inscriptions and, and reliefs don't provide the same window. I mean, that's the question because Kalugamala is so different. So, but I know at Utamapalium, there are a few female aid devotees mentioned in the inscriptions. So that is, um, but apart from that, and again, that's another site that has at least a good corpus. The other sites that I'm dealing with, you know, sometimes have one, two, just a handful of reliefs. And so you only get one, two, you know, a handful of inscriptions. So it's hard to make a case, right, from such small evidence, not limited evidence, I guess I would say. Um, and then, yeah, the question of, yeah, what to do there. So when I went I, and trying to think about experience and then think about activities, I thought because of sites like Kalugamalai and Utamapalim have so many reliefs, does this mean they were, you know, more accessible, more popular? Um, you know, the, the fact that you can have so many donative inscriptions. Um, and again, looking at the village names that are included in, in that inscriptional evidence to give us an idea that they are on some kind of pilgrimage circuit, that you can visit that. And like I said, I think that that billboard at Kila Kuliukudi was so cool because it kind of was modern day trying to make these connections and i'm wondering are those con were those connections available then um julie hanlon is a scholar who um she wrote a dissertation on these places um around Madurai, and she again really wanted to argue their accessibility i mean today they're so hard to get to and um, but she really wanted to talk about them as being, you know, connected to thriving populaces. And I think that's just something because of the barrenness when we see it today, it's really hard to envision that. But I think 
I think they must have been. And I think the fact that they, you know, were so visible in everyone's, you know, lived experiences there that one would take a pilgrimage to these sites, you know, that there would be more knowledge of how do we get there and it would be easier to get. I, I honestly think that's, you know, the case. So today it's kind of hard to relive that kind of experience because it, they are extremely hard. And you're right, once you get there, what do you do? Um, are you just engaging with the ascetic community that's there? Is that the main purpose? That's, is that the main goal? Um, and especially like at Oligar Malai, which was really hard. And um, and then doing all that work to get there. And then there was just the one single relief, you know? <laughs> which is, <laughs> and so um, again, is the main purpose then to make just that interaction with the community, the living community that's there. Um, and so that relief just serving as a signpost for that um, and marking this new site, right? As it's continuance, you know, tapping into the heritage of the past, but continuing it anew with Ajanandi's lineage, you know, something. Anyway, I, I think they were probably more connected and I, it's hard to imagine it, but I, I think it's important that we do. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's a uh, there couple of more questions uh, in, uh, in the Q&A box. So Hari Krishnan asked one more question. Can you comment a bit more on the earlier Jaina cave temples and their ritual use, given that Jaina's presence is visible in the material context in the Sangam period, but is absent in the literary context for a long time? So um, as far as what kinds of performances happened in the residences, um, yeah, that's kind of hard to, to capture from the art historical evidence because literally what we have are the beds and we don't have those carvings again, don't uh, of Jinnah reliefs don't come until the ninth century. Um, clearly we have earlier caves and spaces to go into. I would assume we could have structural um, temples that would have been uh, maybe built out of more ephemeral materials near those abodes um, that would provide you know, spaces for ritual practice for both uh, the monastic community and for the lay communities, um, having those engagements and interactions. So um, again, in terms of trying to recontextualize how those spaces were used, right, is really hard because it seems that given the evidence that residential area you know, was kept intact. And in, I mean, and without seemingly, you know, doing images and things until the ninth century. So, and, and what's also interesting, if we think about communities then coming in in the ninth century, making these modifications, making these transformations, the beds and the actual residence areas themselves remain untouched. So they're not coming in and making new beds and they're not coming in and creating like, um, I don't know, more, a, a greater ocu, um inhabitable space. They're not doing anything with the residents per se. Um, those are left completely as they were from the third and second centuries BCE. Um, and it's only with this, this addition of relief carvings. Um, again, sometimes directly over the bed, sometimes on rocks to the side. That's the modification. And that's what made me so interested in this was as to why those are, why not create a cave? Why not why not expand the residence in new ways? And that wasn't done. The residences remain just as they were from the third and second century BCE. So that was important to keep that part of the past completely intact. Can I, can I just come in? Yeah, sure. Uh, sure yeah. Uh, I was just wondering why you don't bring Sitana Vassal in. I mean, that's a painted, um, you know, surely um, that's sort of in between your two chronology yeah I should I, yeah I don't I mean I ha I, I've I've <laughs> I have visited it I it, and that was before I think I was visiting and thinking about sit ton of us all more along the line you know as a cave and I know and I brought oh. that into my thoughts about a lore no but this is again this is an artificial division on my part thinking of it as space and cave um but you're right thinking about that how that space works really effectively because you have the rock cut beds on the other side of the cave. And so you've got both 
beautifully there and beautifully preserved, actually. Um, thanks for that, um, Himanshu. I, I will, let me revisit Sitanavasal with this new work. No, seriously, I mean, just because it does provide another window into thinking about it. And I purposefully or unconsciously, I don't know, left it out because again, it's an actual cave and I was really focusing on relief stuff. But it's, um, why wasn't, I mean, a good question would be, why wasn't something more like Sitana Vassal? Why doesn't that explode all over Tamil Nadu? That same kind of setup with the beauty, you know, the cave and the residences. Like, why is not that become the pattern? That's a great question. Yeah. The next one is not a question. It's a compliment. Tara Hasnan says a very informative and thought-provoking talk. And thank you for the pictures of so many sites. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. They, have, they're wonderful, wonderful um, sites to visit. Yeah. Yes. I have one question, a couple of questions more, actually. One is that, uh, have you? I mean, I'm bringing some of my academic prejudices into the thing. Uh, have you considered that some of these uh, reliefs might be commemorative? Because in Pechipalam, there is an inscription about a monk who died of snake bite. So could some of these carvings be to commemorate some dead people? Yeah, ab absolutely. So um, yeah, is that the is that is that the twelfth century inscription that has um, with uh, that's associated with uh, I think the the padas the feet at Pechipalam. Uh -huh. Maybe. I'm not, I don't remember exactly, but I remember one of the inscriptions talks about a monk yeah. who uh, succumbed to snake bite. Okay, I'll have to look into that, that died from okay. snake bite. Um, so yeah, so thinking of a more, in terms of more commemorative. Yeah, I mean, so those scholars who have identified, for example, at um, Alagarmalai and Kurungalakudi, you know, these as being portrait statues of Achanandi, um, I don't thinking about it as it's commemorating or maybe even commemorating the the community at large. Are there would you would you consider because I know your work at the commemorative things at Badami have been really important for me <laughs> in those reliefs. Um, would it be for individuals um, that they would? I'm trying to think, like, for example, um, Would they function in similar ways as those commemorative reliefs um, at Badami, meaning for individual people, or could they stand for communities? Or I mean, what, do you have thoughts on that? I, I've just uh, because of the, the, there's a tradition of commemorative sculptures like this in uh, Shavan Belgola, but then yeah. they had, and even in Badami in the Jain cave, you, when you enter on the right, you have the uh, you have you have a uh, uh, panel which shows a lady, I forgot her name, uh, a, a lay uh, uh, woman devotee, who's no, no, but the composition is different. They show the person being commemorated, sitting with the guru and a, a, a Tirthankara in the background, a large image of Tirth. So that doesn't seem to be here in this uh -huh. case. Uh -huh. so, so I'm not really sure about it, whether it could be different in Tamil Nadu or. Yeah, that's great. Maybe even thinking about, um... Visually, are they functioning in similar ways as like those, yeah, those commemorative like hero stones that you see all over Karnataka, for example? Mm. Yeah. I like, I, I, I'd have to think about that. I, yeah. I, yeah Something I mean, worth following, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Is it time for us to? Uh, I have one more question, if you don't mind. Uh, was there a discontinuity between the uh, the 3rd century BCE to maybe 1st century AD and then the uh, 8th, 9th century uh, reoccupation? Was there a desertion of the site? Or? Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, Champaka Lakshmi has kind of, I think, more thoroughly kind of investigated that. We do have, um, I mean, she's kind of looked at some of the evidence and tried to figure out if were some of these sites continually occupied and we just don't have any record of that continuous occupation or, you know, is there a gap? So I think different, different sites are going to have a different answer to that. But it's really, again, hard to see what kind of evidence is left behind about, you know, the occupation with that. Unless someone's, you know, adding inscriptions. Um, you know, that then suggests continued use, which I think is mm -hmm. certainly possible. But there's also this seemingly interest in, again, preserving how these things were. I mean, there's just not a lot of evidence 
if they were continually used, that other communities are making their marks, you know, adding records and inscriptions, uh, for example, on the on the beds mm. um, or around the natural shelter. Um, there, there could also be a lot more inscriptions there that I am not aware of. So, I mean, coming at this more, again, from the art historical angle, and maybe throughout that area, maybe not necessarily at the residence itself, but there could be other inscriptions in the landscape that would provide ideas about um, continued occupation. Um, so I think certain sites may indeed have been, and again, Champaka Lakshmi's work, who I cited at the beginning of the talk, um, I know she has gone through and looked at and tried to determine certain ones that she thought were continually inhabited throughout. So apologies for making it seem like a big gap, because there might not have been at many of those sites. Thank you. Mm -hmm, thank okay, you. There's one more question, I think. Uh, yeah, it's from Katie Devendra, a comment. The iconography are more for branding than for worship. Yeah, so that's a great way to think of it. I thought of it as kind of a monastic branding for the ones associated with Achanandi. Um, but also, again, this idea to when you have so many Jinnah reliefs, like at Kalugamalai and at the Mapalium carved all over, I mean, it's making a visual statement, a very emphatic statement. And again, even though I, I don't want to discount the power of having these rocks covered with these reliefs. And again, even though they're not identified as Jinnahs and Arhats, I mean, visually, everyone knows they're Jinnahs <laughs> because you can, you know, you know the iconography very clearly. Um, so it is definitely creating that presence there through through the reliefs. So thank you for that. Okay, one can more I, question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, can I come mm -hmm. in? The, yeah. Uh, no, yeah. thanks a lot for bringing in the landscape because I thought the whole, you know, the way your talk unfolded, um, it really moved out from looking at the beds um, and then, you know, engaging with the caves, but then gradually with the larger landscape. Um, and we see this again, you know, with temples, with other sites where, um, I mean, even um, uh, uh, even Dr. Menon's work, you know, yeah. not just Badami, but, you know, the whole, the whole Aihole, Badami, you know, and the whole landscape around it, that these connect. You know, we have got so used to looking at a site as a single site. You know, we just look mm -hmm. at a temple or a cave and that's it. And, you know, whether it's this, that or the other, that we never connect to the larger landscape. And I just thought that rather than uh, Jainism shrinking, what your talk showed was mm. exactly the opposite of Jainism expanding um, from the beds into now this, uh, you know, these sort of uh, sites which could be seen uh, from other sites and people moving around a larger circuit than mm -hmm. just going to, you know, one or the other. And in this, I mean, the important uh, point were the lineages, you know, the monks that you name, mm -hmm. uh, the monks who become whether, they, you know, I mean, they, some of the images could be commemorative, but that the monks uh, then play an important part in expanding this, uh, this space. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for getting us to think about the landscape um, as, um, you know, as sort of really playing out the expansion of Jainism rather than mm. what has generally been assumed. Yeah, thanks very much. I'm glad that that came across because that's, it, it was my own journey to try to <laughs> move from also just looking at the reliefs to, again, really turning around and thinking about how they're functioning in a much larger context, but also just physically from the relief to the actual hill, right? Which is really what was visible to many people living, especially around in Madurai. Yeah. I think there are no more questions. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Owen, for a wonderful talk. I mean, I had a very enjoyable evening listening to you and thinking about some of these things. And I must thank IIC for conducting this seminar, uh, for uh, hosting the seminars and Professor Himanshu Prabha Rai for being mm -hmm. the brain behind this. And thank you to all the participants for so making making this discussion very lively towards the end also. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. <laughs>